So, there you are at the mediation table, facing two people who are deep in their own experience of anger. One is raucously raging, and the other is silently seething. It's a classic case of each one standing in their box marked, I'm right, you're not, and when are you finally going to figure out that you need to listen to me? No listening to each other, no respect, no hearing each other, just seething and anger. And as you observe this all too familiar scene, you remember that not too long ago, you spoke with each of them separately and had a reasonable conversation with them. And you know that outside of this moment, they're intelligent, rational, reasonable people who can carry on conversations, but not here. Here, they have become undone. Here, they are faced with the object of their angst. They have, uh, they're not listening, they're not hearing, and they're not thinking rationally. Likely their heart rate is off the charts, their breathing is so shallow it's hardly audible, and they are just raging inside their brain. They may not be high conflict people, but I can assure you that they are high on conflict. So this is our work. We are facilitating, we facilitate conversations, whether we're mediators, lawyers, arbitrators, therapists, parents, partners, or neighbors. Our work is to shift people out of conflict and out of this box marked, I'm right and you're not, and into a more harmonious, collaborative, open way of thinking. Negotiation, collaboration, and possibly even reconciliation. But as long as even one of those parties is high on conflict, no amount of skillful negotiations will work. We may get a tacit agreement, but not a real in-the-heart agreement. No matter how good your interest-based approaches are, it just won't work. So the fact is, and we now know, I can't do this very well, and we now know um, that it is a scientific fact that when we get anxious, angry, afraid, defensive, our brain literally gets flooded with a stew of hormones. We feel closed down, we feel protected, and all we want to do is stand in our box marked, I'm right, you're not, and you need to tell me why I should listen to you. Because what's happening in our brain when we feel anxious is this flood of of, of protective hormones and, and chemicals, cortisol, uh, adrenaline, testosterone. These are the kinds of hormones that have been coming into our brain and helping us move into that fight-flight pattern since our ancestors were paving caves in, in Lascaux. Thousands and thousands of years, our brains have been developing those fight-flight behaviors. So, and those fight-flight behaviors take place in this back part of our brain called the limbic brain, the old part of our brain that is designed, is meant to protect us, and that's what it does. So the moment we get into that, that feeling, real or perceived, that we are not in friendly territory, our brain immediately sets in those, that, that flood of, of protective hormones. So, so what does this have to do with us? What it has to do with us is that our job is to move people out of this spot. And so how do we do that? How do we move people out of that spot, that anger spot, and into a more harmonious place? One word. Neuroscience. So neuroscience is the study of the relationship between our nervous system and our brain. It's very interesting. Now, it's, you know, it's a very interesting word, and it really has a lot of cachet when you throw it around 
at a party through sips of, of Chardonnay, and you just throw around this word neuroscience. It's a very, a very good word to use. But it does have a lot of value in our work, and I'll tell you why. The reason it has a lot of value in our work is because the more we know about how the brain operates, the, the more we know about what happens in our brain, the more we can actually change it and shift it and move it into a less conflicted, less protected place. So it used to be that, uh, that scientists thought that our brains were very much like this, solid. Our circuitry was solid. It meant that however you were born, you just had to live with the brain that you got. So if by chance you were born with a brain uh, or, or um, a less than average ability to read, let's say, too bad, so sad for you, you just had to live with it. End of story. Now we know, at least that's what neuroscientists have come up with in the last few hundred years, that our brain, you remember these little silly putty things, our brains are more like this more like a plastic shaping where we can actually change it. It, ac it can actually be molded. It can be malleable. And plastic is the operative word because the science that's come out of that is called neoplasticity. And neoplasticity means that we have the ability to change the patterning in our brain. So, why should we care about that? So here's why. So let's say you were someone who thought positively a lot. You were able to look on the positive side of things. You were able to, to reframe, revision, see things from an alternate point of view. What happens every time you do that mental activity of reframing and thinking positively, the synapses in our brain actually get deeper and more connected so that you can use those positive synapses more often. And that becomes your kind of MO. You're able to reframe, able to think positively. So that's a really good thing. Well, the, the, the snag in that, brain development is that the opposite is also true. So that if you're the kind of person that just tends to look on the negative side of things, that too is what's going to be developing in your brain and really strengthening synapses. So if you're the kind or you know someone who just always seems to be looking on the negative side of things or always seems to be feeling on or, or expressing protective or, or negative behavior, negative attitude, they are continually and consistently strengthening that wiring as well. And that becomes their MO, consciously and unconsciously. That's all part of that conversation of unconscious bias. It's all part of the conversation of you know, conscious competence. It's how, our, how we are developing our brains. So where does that leave us? So if we come back to where we are now and what our work is. And our work is facing people who are moving into that negative frame of mind. So let's go back to those, our two disputants, the one who was raucously raging and the one who was silently seething. And let's look at them and see what we can do to get them, to move them out of their brains. Because what we want to do in a neuroscience kind of a way is we want to shift those disputants, those people who are expressing those anger out of those, that, that limbic part of our brain and into our front neocortex brain, that front part of our brain that actually can stop and say, you know, I don't agree with you, but I'll listen, tell me what you got. And the only way that we can help people to do that is by changing, by shifting them 
out of their negative thinking and into possibility thinking. So how do we do that? That is, therein lies the question, how do we do that? So here is the equation that you've been looking for. It all comes down to one word. And when I tell you this word, you're going to say, that's just way too simple. It's just, it's not that simple. But here is the word. The word is respect. So how this word works is when we feel that we have been listened to, we feel that we have been attended to, we feel that we're being uh, acknowledged, no longer are we, are we feeling as though we're in enemy territory. We feel okay. We're being listened to. We can speak. The person may not agree with us, but at least we're able to speak without knowing that there's any negative consequences. So I ask you, when was the last time you got into an argument with someone who was actually listening to you? Likely never. The thing is, when someone listens actively, engaging us in listening, we feel respected. So here's the equation. Respect, and that means the act of listening. Respect equal trust, because suddenly our brains are open. We're not feeling protected anymore. Respect equal trust. And the moment we feel that, our bodies get flooded with all of those great hormones, serotonin, dopamine, and oxytocin. And you may have heard of oxytocin because that's often called the love drug. So oxytocin is the hormone that gets released that helps us actually connect into relationship and, and lets us be more open to what another person is saying. So respect equals trust. Trust equals oxytocin. Oxytocin equals relationship. And relationship leads to harmony and collaboration. So that is our work. So how do we do that? How we do that is, uh, how we do that is with three, three strategies. The three strategies will result in this, taking someone from being high on conflict to listening in respect. So here's how we do that. The first thing is, you want to create a calm room. That's one of the first things we want to do. When people come in, you want to create a calm room. You might want to open the blinds, let in um, um, light. You might even want to play some music. Now, it might not be cool to have music playing, so you might want to put your Mozart in on so low that it's inaudible, but I can assure you it will change the space. And you might also want to serve up some kind of dried fruit or really healthy thing. Now, it's a really nice thing to have at the mediation table, but the other thing that it does, aside from being a really nice thing, it actually calms our bodies when we have some really good healthy food. So, imagine walking into a mediation room that is, that's set up formally, but has all these really nice additions to it. The second thing we want to do is you actually want to model the behavior yourself. You want to be able to present the kind of energy that you want the others to have. You don't, don't, you don't want to be speaking too quickly, at least not rapid fire. Calm speaking, breathing deeply, and presenting a calm exterior for them to model. And the third and key piece that will get us there is to be very specific about how people are to treat each other. Be set a very high bar on how each party listens to each other and really stick with it. No interrupting, active listening, acknowledgement, and respect. And once people at the mediation table feel that they are respected, that they are heard, that they are going to be listened to, 
suddenly the energy will change. People will speak, people will hear, they'll calm. So I say, get your agreement contracts ready. You'll be needing them. Thank you. One question for you. Yeah. I wanted to ask you quickly, um, in terms of uh, what have you found is the most effective way to, can you hear me? What, is, what have you found is the most effective way to get people to shift away from conflict? Besides what you might have outlined, is there one particular thing that you see as a real foolproof thing to do? Um, I have found that when people come into a mediation, they are anxious, they're um, in their protective mode, um, and they're feeling they're, they're very high on conflict. I have found that when I am um, welcoming them and I make them laugh, I can make them feel really relaxed, and I reduce the, just the high conflict energy in the room and make them feel that they are actually in, in, um, in the company of allies, not of enemies. Then they sit down and they become more comfortable and less protected. So every stage along the way, I model this, I'm okay, you're okay, it's gonna be okay kind of feeling. Um, and if they're high on anxiety, I will be sure to speak slower. I'll make sure that the words that come out of my mouth are really heard because they're actually not hearing. They're just in their own heads. So I'll make sure to speak in a way that they're actually hearing. And if I feel that they're distracted, I'll speak until, or I'll, I'll change how I speak to them so that they're getting more grounded. And, I, and so I ensure that before we even begin, I feel that both parties or all parties are, are, are kind of grounded in their own way. Okay. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Suzanne Shurkin.